And our first guest this evening is Father Brian Massengale. He is Professor of Theological and Social Ethics at Fordham University. He was professor also at Marquette University. He's a leader in the field of theological ethics and is a past convener, a convener of the Black Catholic Theological Symposium and former president of the Catholic Theological Society of America. In addition to his academic pursuits, he strives to be a scholar activist through serving faith-based groups advancing justice in society. He's a noted authority on issues of social and racial justice and has served as a consultant to the United States Catholic Conference of Catholic Bishops. Welcome to the Busted Halo Show, Father Brian Massingale. How are you? Oh, sorry, I'm having a little trouble with the, oh, the mute is un, oh, there you are. Hello, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Father Dave, how are you? I'm doing pretty well. And uh, thank you for taking time to join us. I would imagine um, that today and yesterday, you've probably been back to back on the Zoom and Skype interviews. A lot of people want to hear from you. So thank you, I appreciate your time. <laughs> yeah, it's good to be with you. Yes, um, since the article, the essay appeared on Monday, um, um, the tablet from, from London, England, the Italian, uh, the um, English newspaper of uh, record there, uh, Catholic newspaper, plus the leading Italian Catholic newspaper have all been in touch with me. So yes, it, yes it's generated a lot of conversation. So I'm happy to share the conversation with your listeners. So the, the article specifically that we're talking about, and of course you have many more things to say throughout your career about this topic that has emerged once again and, and hopefully doesn't just quickly die down and we go back to quote unquote normal because uh, normal is, is not normal or not uh, uh, fair not or ethical, equally justice just. and not ethical and not just for so many people. Uh, but this conversation that has, uh, has emerged, one of the things that um, I think is maybe more difficult for many of us who are not people of color to kind of grasp, I think you very well gave us examples and ways to think about it in your article called The Assumptions of White Privilege and What We Can Do About It. So uh, first of all, just like anything else in our society that becomes uh, very polemic very quickly, even that term, some people hear that and they go, oh, that's wrong. There's no such thing. I don't want to hear about this. What, what do we mean when we say that? And how can, and how can those of us who are Caucasian, not instantly feel uh, so put off that we close our ears and think that this is uh, attacking us. Okay, so the first thing I do whenever I talk to you about this topic, whether I'm giving a lecture, workshop, or teaching, is that I always tell my audience, one, if you feel uncomfortable during this conversation, if you feel angry, if you feel guilty, if you feel ashamed, if you feel embarrassed, that makes you human. So don't check out because you're feeling these emotions, okay? There are very few issues that engage our, our emotional discomfort level um, as race in America. So first thing to understand is that you're going to feel those emotions, but don't check out. And so I'm telling that to your listeners right now too. Um, secondly, is that we cannot have honest conversations about race in America without making white people uncomfortable. The number one question I get when I talk about this issue is, um, Father, how can I talk about this in my parish or in my school or in my classroom and not make white people uncomfortable? <laughs> and I say, now let's think about that question though. Why is it that the only group that's never allowed or supposed to be allowed to feel uncomfortable are white people? That discounts the discomfort that people like me, I'm an African-American priest, uh, just celebrated my 37th anniversary. Uh, uh, congratulations, uh, happy anniversary. Uh, yeah, um, but that discounts our uh, uncomfort and discomfort. And it means that we, it can't be taken, or we have to tailor it so that people can hear. So the way I would explain white privilege, going back to your question is this. It basically means that because of the way we all know race works in America, is that it's easier to be white in America than it is to be a person of color. Now, I'm not saying that people, that white people don't have to work hard for what they get, because that's the other thing people will say. But I work hard for what I got. Yes, you did, absolutely. However, you did not have to carry the burden of what it means to be black. And the way I got, got to that was I was, in, in, in the essay, I was thinking about um, all of the, the, the headlines that we got, you know, the, the, the death of George Floyd, the, the death of um, Ahmed Ar Ar Arbery, the death of Breonna Taylor, all of these major, you know, terrible tragedies that, and outrages that we've experienced. 
But then I said, there's, a, there's another incident that happened. And it got buried because the same day that it happened, we had the, the terrible thing in Minneapolis. And that was in Central Park when that morning a young white woman called, her, called the police on her phone saying that there was a black man who was threatening her and to send the cops all because he had politely asked her to put her dog on the leash as the park regulations you know, state or stipulate. And what I thought to myself was, we all know what she was doing. She knew what she was doing. She knew the way race worked in America, that she would have the presumption of being believed and he would have the presumption of being disbelieved. Yeah, I mean, it, it was it was very powerful to hear you really break down one by one uh, a list of a tremendous list of bullet points, such as she assumed that she would have the presum presumption of in innocence. She assumed that he, the black man, would have a presumption of guilt. She assumed that the police would back her up. She assumed that her race would be an advantage and that she would be believed because she is white, and then you put parenthetically, by the way, this is what we mean by white privilege. And then you go on with another lengthy list, which as I'm reading, it, I'm going, wow, all those things are at play. And I think one of the important things about this conversation that we're all having at this time is for us to admit that they are, uh, because the, the problem with admitting that they are is that the people that have the advantage don't want to admit that they do, because then that might mean, ooh, do I have to share some of my advantage or will I have less of an advantage later on? Well, not only that, but I think that if we, if we admit that we know that there is an advantage to being white and there's a disadvantage to being black, then we have to do something about it. Or we have to say we're comfortable with that reality. Right. But, and this is the point I was making in the article, it's not simply that there are advantages to being white, is that the disadvantage, the the malevolent part of this is that she could use her race in a way to make life harder for him. And that's the thing, as people have told me, that they found the most difficult thing to accept was that, okay, at some early age, I might have realized that it was easier to be white. And at some early age, I might have said, okay, I'm, I'm really glad I'm not black, although I would never say it that, that way because it sounds bad when I say it that way. But to realize that, my, that because of the way Amer race works in America, that I could, if I wanted to, make life harder for someone else. I don't want to admit that. But that's what Amy Cooper did in Central Park. And without that assumption, her, the situation doesn't make sense. And without that assumption, Without that truth, without that reality, then the situation becomes unintelligible. Now, we don't want to admit that, but that's exactly what's going on. Joining us here on the Busted Halo Show, past convener of the Black Catholic Theological Symposium, Father Brian Massengill from Fordham University right here in New York City. Um, I want to ask, and you'll forgive me, perhaps one of the stupidest questions. You just said that she realized, and you made the point in the article, that also the man, the black man that she called the, the police on, also understood all of this framework and understood that he was at a disadvantage. And you used the phrase just now, that's how race works in America. This is a dumb question, but why does it work that way? It works that way because we've decided to make it work that way. <laughs> Simply, I mean... Me me meaning, thing, meaning the people in power have decided because typically the people in power, power can't decide things. But, but not just the people in power, okay? okay? okay. You see, this is where, I say this is the, ways, the reason why I wanted to talk about Amy Cooper, because she's an ordinary human being. She's just like, you know, any one of our listeners, any one of our parishioners. But she understood the way race worked, and so she actually work her privilege. Yeah. And the thing is that this is the thing that ordinary people do is that, okay, yes, the system may have been set up before we came to be, we were born into it. But on some level, we help perpetuate it by the fact that we know that when we're in, when, um, in um, gatherings of family and friends and someone tells a racist joke and we decide not to say anything or we excuse it by saying, oh, that's just the way grandma was raised, or she's from a different generation, 
or deep down your friend is really a good person, by not saying something, by not doing something, we're perpetuating the situation. Because as long as white people know that other white people won't call them out, then we create the spaces in which racial animosity and misunderstanding can continue and fester and brew. And that may sound really trivial, but it's not. Because whenever we, we denigrate people by hateful names or by hostile jokes, we dehumanize them. We make them less than we are. And we create the environments where more tragic things happen, such as George Floyd or Ahmaud Arbery. That didn't just happen. It happened because people continue to let it happen by the everyday ways in which we don't say something. Father Brian Massengale is our guest here on the Busted Halo Show. He's a professor of theological and social ethics at Fordham University. Do you see in, in your work with young people, do you see hope, change uh, is now a, a moment? I mean, we can look back on the history of America and we might have looked back and saw, well, maybe here's the moment uh, when, the, you know, the, uh, the 13th Amendment was the moment. Maybe in the early 20th century, maybe the 1960s, civil rights, Dr. King. Uh, it seems like there's been a, mod, a lot of moments and some has changed, but still a lot has not. Does this feel like a moment and how can we capitalize on that? I don't know if this is a moment or not. Um, when I'm most optimistic, I say that this could be a turning point that, for example, during the 1960s um, and 1965, Bloody Sunday happened in Selma, Alabama, when the police cameras captured, uh, when, the, when the press cameras captured peaceful demonstrators being clubbed viciously by the Alabama State Patrol. There were dogs and can water cannons and tear gas turned on these people. That became a moment when not lefty liberals, but moderate whites said they were sickened. And they said, this can't be. I think what really happened, what happened to George Floyd isn't new. We've been dealing with this since Trayvon Martin, since Michael Brown, since Tamir Rice, since, and there've been hundreds of these events. And each time we get there, it seems that we were met with incomprehension. People say, well, he did something to, to, to cause this. He did something to deserve this. With George Floyd, people saw that for eight minutes and 46 seconds, this man did nothing to deserve being killed. I think that was a real wake-up call to people saying, oh, there really is something profoundly broken here. I'm hoping that this is the kind of moment that leads to a real change and not simply a flash in the pan. But I think it really depends upon what ordinary Americans and ordinary Catholics do. We don't want ordinary Catholics to simply say, oh, well, okay, let's do something, you know, let's have a commission or something and we can move, move beyond this. I think this is a call for deep personal examination and to ask, where in my life have I been willing to tolerate racial exclusion? Where have I noticed something being obviously wrong and not chosen to speak up? I would, I would challenge my brother priests. Because one of the things I, I find, I out, whenever I ask my students this question, I ask them, when is the last time you heard a homily on racism? And I say, no, not just last year, three years, because that's the, that's the lectionary cycle, Sunday readings, okay? And it never fails that fewer than 10% of my students will say they heard a homily on racism or racism in the past three years. I think this is a moment that calls us priests to some serious self-examination. And I know what priests will say, they'll say that, well, we don't want to upset people again. We don't want, again, that's the whole thing. We don't want to make white people uncomfortable. Now we have no problem making people feel uncomfortable in any number of other issues. <laughs> we don't. Right, right, right. We have that's no right. problem making people feel uncomfortable when we preach about, you know, the church's commitment to life. We have no problem when we talk about the church's commitment to family and, and you know, talking about the, the controversies over same-sex marriage. 
we have no problem making people feel uncomfortable, except when it comes to race. And I think this is a moment of profound self-examination that do we really believe that all human beings are created in the image and likeness of God, without exception, yeah. no small print? And are we willing then to talk about the implications and consequences of that belief when it comes to how this country has treated people of color for a long, long time? Father Brian Massigale is our guest here on the Busted Halo Show. Uh, we're speaking with him from his offices at Fordham University and uh, from around our Busted Halo world. Um, before I let you go, because I know it's a busy day for you, um, it seems to me that at least from if we looked at, at this from a, a Christian theological perspective, um, that we, we see all throughout the Old and New Testament, maybe even crystallized so profoundly in Mary's beautiful Magnificat prayer, the notion that when God's justice is flourishing, it will necessarily produce what we kind of use as, as a jargon in, in scripture study called the reversal of fortunes, that yeah. the poor will be lifted up and th th that doesn't end there. And mm -hmm. the rich will be brought low, that the hungry will be fed, and those who have lots of food will go away hungry. Go now, away now we, we, yes. we, we love, you know, if you're on, on one side of, of that equation, you love that prayer. But mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're on the high side of the equation, you either think, well, that's a nice little prayer, but don't like kind of run and go, yeah, let's, let's make that happen. Do you think, uh, Father Brian, that this would be, uh, is it a matter of seeing the, the uh, un, unconditional love and mercy and fruitfulness of God that we can live in our faith, seeing it as finite, meaning that if I allow some other person to have more, more of whatever, more of, of the water that is scarce or more of the oil we're taking out of the ground or just more power, privilege, prestige, then that means necessarily it's a zero-sum game and that must mean that I have I have less. And I, who, who would want to do that? Nobody's going to want to if they're in the position of, of power necessarily without some real uh, backbending and sacrifice. They're not going to want to give that away. Mm -hmm, but, but, mm -hmm. but, but should we be looking at it that way? I mean, God is not a zero-sum game. Well, and you see, this, is, this brings us to the deepest contribution that the church can make to the cause for racial justice. Because you're absolutely right. People are not willing to make significant sacrifices unless they can see their life as part of a broader religious and spiritual narrative. I think part of our problem is that we have not preached the fact that God loves us immensely. And when I stand in awe of the immensity of God's love, something else that takes over, and that is, I want to make sure that all human beings are treated as beloved children of God. But I first have to internalize that message myself, that I am deeply beloved by God. And when I am deeply beloved by God, then it will be intolerable for me to live in a world where my brother and sister is not treated as a beloved child of God. Because if we are indeed loved children of God, then each of us has in irreplaceable dignity and respect. Whenever I teach this to my students, my students, I say, I ask them, when you go into church, you see a, a burning lamp in front. What does that burning lamp mean? And they say, yeah, it means that Jesus is in the tabernacle. I said, right, it means that the Blessed Sacrament is there. It's a sacred place. I said, if we believe our faith, we should walk around and see that every human being has a sanctuary lamp in front of them. It doesn't matter whether they're black, brown, Asian, Native American, every human being has a sanctuary lamp burning in front of them. Now, if we really believe that that person is sacred, then we have to take the next step and say that what happened to George Floyd, to Amon Arbery, and to so many others is not only a crime, we have to say it's a desecration. And that's not just this kind of, you know, lefty Fordham professor talking. <laughs> um, no, today, um, Pope Francis gave a very beautiful statement in talking about the United States. He said that he's holding the United States, the people of Minneapolis, people of the whole country in, in his prayer. 
He's changed praying for everyone who's lost their lives because of the sin of racism. Then he also went on and said, we cannot say that we stand in favor of life and we're willing to turn a blind eye to racism because racism insults the sacred dignity that God has already given each one of us. So yes, we need to see that, yes, I am a temple of Jesus Christ. Yes, I have a blessed, I have a sanctuary lamp in front of me, but so does everyone else, especially those that I've been trained to despise and fear. Mm -hmm. We do not believe that people lose that sanctuary lamp. Even the most coarsest criminal still has that sanctuary lamp burning in front of them. And I think it's high time that this country and that the Catholics ask ourselves, do we really believe that? And are we willing then to have a Catholic witness and that Catholic witness means that at times we're going to challenge, you know, practices in our society that would extinguish that sanctuary there. And thank you for challenging us because we do need that challenge. Father Brian Massingale of Fordham University. We'll put a link on our radio blog to the article that has sparked a good amount of discussion and I hope pushes us forward. It's called The Assumptions of White Privilege and What We Can Do About It. Amy Cooper knew exactly what she was doing. We all do. And that's the problem. Father Brian, thank you so much for joining us here on the Busted Halo Show. Thank you very much, Father Dave. God Blessed bless you. See you on your ministry. Okay. Thank you. All right. Bye -bye. When we return, lots more Busted Halo Show coming for you. So keep it on the Catholic Channel, Sirius XM 129.